factors that come into play with this. But that being said, these are still excellent for education and entertainment. And that's all the disclaimers that I want to be able to give. Let's go ahead and roll the intro. stick to the YouTube guidelines as best as I can, so that will prevent me from offering some of the more gruesome details of the Stephanie Lazarus crime. But back in 1986, Stephanie Lazarus was an LAPD officer, and a crime was committed towards the significant other of somebody that she used to date. Now, the details of that crime are quite brutal, but it does include physical assault, both with a firearm and the butt thereof, and also fighting. What makes it interesting is that some of the wounds that are inflicted upon the victim happened after death. The investigation ensued and a tip was given to the investigators to look at Stephanie Lazarus at the time, but since she was on the force, they decided that it wasn't worth their time. So the case was then closed as a cold case for many years before it was reopened up to the main learning who's an activity in the precinct, and they started over as if from scratch. Immediately, it became evident through DNA evidence that Stephanie was at the scene of the crime itself. They brought her in for questioning, and shortly thereafter found her guilty. I was very frustrated to hear the ineptitude of the initial investigators in this case refusing to look at one of their own as a possible suspect, despite being tipped off and also there being physical evidence of her at the scene. Very frustrated on that front, but that's enough backstory. Let's go ahead and dive into the actual analysis itself. Well, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. I So I know that this starts off into the middle of the interrogation. There's some before this, there's some after the segments that I'm going to be working on here. This is some specifically selected areas that are more interesting and engaging. But something to note on Stephanie Lazarus's non-verbal baseline is that she has very, very intense eyes. That's something that's a part of her, so it can't be used as evidence, therefore, later on, unless it's significant in that area. Along with that, she has a fairly expressive face, and this is both good and bad for her case. In some areas, the expressions are shown to be false. In other areas, the expressions are shown to be true, and it's very revealing to a nonverbal analyst to be able to assess what her face is emoting at the time. During this read, I will be paying attention to things like tonal and verbal cues, along with what her face is telling me, and from what I can see, what the rest of her body language is telling me as well. And we will build this character sketch non-verbally as to who she is, and by the end, we would be able to say whether or not we would find her guilty. Now, in this case, obviously, we find her as guilty because she already has been found as guilty and there was physical evidence, but this is still, like I said, for the sake of entertainment and for the sake of understanding how to read non-verbal communication. Let's continue on. <laughs> So she's having trouble verbally processing and she's acting very taken aback and for a little side history here, they didn't tell her that she was coming in to be interrogated for this murder that happened ages ago. They told her that it was for something else so that they can get her in there and have her guard down. So she is actually quite surprised by this so that verbal stammering and stuttering is to be expected by that level of anxiety. You can also see a contempt smile on her face with one half of her face going upwards and the other half remaining steady. That is an indicator of moral or intellectual superiority, as many of you already know if you've watched this channel before. Let's continue watching. You are. Yeah. 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 I mean, Stephanie, here's the situation. Basically, we, you know, we knew that this when we saw this in, the, in, in this chrono that so you can see that she's starting to panic a little bit as well just by the increase in her breathing this is also common in high anxiety situations agitation an increase in breathing is your body's response to stress it prepares you to be able to fight or freeze or flight sometimes fawn is in there in this case that wouldn't make so much sense but it's part of that response mechanism that we can see coming out here as well she's 
obviously catching on to what's going on, and she's not happy about it. And her face is quite emotive as well, but due to the fact that it is so overtly emotive, we have to look a little bit more carefully to be able to fully analyze what expressions we can see going on. Maybe, you know, there's some relationship there that the comments would indicate that you didn't want that expression of the eyebrows drawn forward and together like that, that can be considered in the anger or frustration or disgust or scorn in that grouping there. But also you can see around her mouth, she has the corners of her nose have a little bit of action and her mouth is playing into that as well, which is another indicator of disgust. So it could be a scorn expression, but in this case, it also would make sense that it's a confusion expression as well. People can be frustrated by being confused, and there's many, many emotions that can play into confusion in and of itself. Regardless, she has scornful confusion right now. She's frustrated that she's been more or less duped into coming into this interrogation. To come up to you at your desk and ask those kinds of questions or do anything. You know how up there people can see what's going on with you in the interview room and people are in there being surprised. So we, we wanted to afford you some privacy, some confidentiality. Okay. Oh, that's fine. And you can see a little micro movement of the head no while saying that's fine. This would be one of those areas of nonverbal seepage that you might be able to expect when somebody doesn't feel the way that they're saying they feel. She says, oh, that's fine, but you can see the slightest movement of a no in there, which is the truthful indicator. It's indeed not fine. She's indeed not happy. And the dismissive gesture goes in line with that. She's not happy about this. Her body language is showing it, but that's pretty obvious so far. Let's continue on about this because we thought it might be, you know, something, you know, you're married to someone else, obviously, and so forth, and that you may not want to, you know, talk about these things in that setting where someone, you know, we don't want the rumor mill or something like that kind of stuff. So, I'm not so we, we, we did this just as, as a means to try and speak to you in okay, a confidential place where you, you know, where... Once again, very many no shakes in there, some shrugs in there, dismissive gestures, looking away. She's not fine with this whatsoever, but she has to be. In this area now, she's realizing that she's stuck here, and she has to figure out a way to maybe go along with them now. So if she can go along with them, maybe they won't suspect her as much. This is already getting to work into her psychology. That's good. That means that it's more likely that she will reveal something, either non-verbally or verbally, as the interrogation goes on, with this being such an early interview. Good to see for the investigator slash interrogator part. Not so good for such where your business isn't out there for other people and you know, your division yeah, and all You know, quite often a million years ago, I mean, you know, um, what year is it now? 2009, and I graduated in 82. Mm -hmm. 82, yeah. Um, you know, we dated. Um, I dated other guys. I'm sure she dated other girls. Um, mm -hmm. Let me ask you, roughly, how long would you say you guys did? I mean, she's attempting to say that she has no idea about any of these details, which could be true. It could be true that she has no recollection of any details. And if this were a normal incident, it would be likely true that she would be fuzzy in areas, perhaps not knowing the exact length of the dating time, perhaps not knowing some of the exact details of the day itself, or anything around that. But this isn't true here, and we know that to be the case because we already know how this one wraps up. So she's compensating here by showing that she has no idea about any of this stuff. How would I have any idea? So this will play into later on as she's trying to say that she has no idea, no idea, no idea. Her go-to during this was to claim that she was clueless the entire time to such a degree that it comes across as obvious, even at this point where they didn't know the answer, it came across as obvious that she wasn't that clueless because she simply couldn't be. Let's continue. I started school there in 78. Mm -hmm. I started to feel like that 1978. Mm -hmm. So here the question, I don't know if you heard it, the question that they asked is how long did you date the person's name is John? How long did you date John? And her response now is to add in so much extraneous detail. And this could be an indicator of truth and it could be an indicator of deceit. But there's some nuances between those two that really come into play in this sort of situation. With indicators of deceit, they pack in extraneous detail that has nothing to do with anything of the story of anything along those lines. It's just 
extra detail. It's meant to go in there to convince you that they're genuinely trying to maybe recollect or trying to give you an honest answer. It's just a smokescreen. In general <coughs> collection, people will recall various details as they continue through their narrative, because as they continue through their narrative, it can jog their own memory, and they'll go back and be like, oh wait, there's this, and then they'll go forward, and so on and so forth. That isn't what she's doing. She's simply hacking her narrative with needless verbiage so that she can hopefully throw up a strong enough smokescreen to get out of this. It doesn't work, obviously, but it is a tactic. So if you see this being done in your life by somebody that you are close to, be it friend, relationship, so on and so forth, if you ask them a question and they start packing it with extraneous details, don't allow that to smokescreen you from your initial question. Still try to find out the answer to that. Let's continue. He graduated in 82. Um, I don't even remember what year he graduated, if it was a year or two before me. Um, I think he was a little bit older than I was. I mean, you know, I can't remember if he was born, but yeah, I'm born in 60, 1960. I don't know if he was born in 58 or 59. I mean, you know, um, I mean, I'm his parents, I'm his sister. So she has a continuous no shake during this time, but it's broad. You can see it. Now, the no shake and the yes shake is something that has come up on the channel quite often and quite regularly because it's a very common movement of the head. Now speaking in American culture, the nod up and down like this, it means yes, and the no back and forth like this, it means no, that's not the case in every culture, but with her, it is because she is in the American culture and many other cultures as well. But in this sort of situation, the broader movements like this, these are commonly conscious movements that the person is doing. They can be related to negative emotions, be it wanting to ward off a negative emotion, or I can't believe it, so an unbelievable, that's the negative side of that, it's not believable, it could be something like that. But there is just as much the possibility that they're simply shaking their head no, because that's the way that their head moves. If you see that happen in a very small, minute fashion, so say they say something positive, but their head just does a very slight no. Well, that's a red flag. That would be considered a red flag, and you should take note of that. During this time, though she's doing it so prevalently, it's such a broad movement. It's not a subconscious movement. Therefore, it's not necessarily non-verbal leakage. She's also having a lot of shrugging mixed in there as well. That's an indicator of insecurity and, and the lack of certainty in what she herself is recollecting, which goes in line with what she's saying. But still, it's irrelevant information that she's giving. They don't care. We don't care. Why is she giving it? It's a smokescreen. His brother went to Northridge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, sister has spent the night at my house before. Obviously, I spent the night at his house before. He probably spent the night at my house before. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't. Correct me if I'm wrong. In the time, you guys dated when you were in college together, right? Yeah, it's probably after college. Um, I'm, I, I can't. Jeez, um, when I met my husband, I met my husband in, um, what, um, We're still just wondering how long you dated. That's what they initially asked, and now they've realized that she's not going to answer that question, and she's going to throw up this large smoke screen, so they kind of tailored it around, but we're still waiting on that, and she still hasn't given that answer. She's trying to throw in so many extraneous details that they lose track of what they're doing. It kind of, from what you can hear, it kind of worked in this area to where now they're asking a different question that they didn't get the answer to their first question to yet, but it is what it is. Let's continue. Mm -hmm. The next one has to be there in Oregon. So we have long stopped you know, dating before that. So you haven't and talked to him for a long time? Oh, I, I think I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, I can't even tell him the last time I talked to him. Um, Interesting verbal repetition. So you haven't talked to him in a long time. Oh, I think, and she starts to close in on herself. Her neck disappears. This is a defensive gesture. She starts shrugging with one side of her shoulder. She has that action up in her eyebrows. She's really trying to convince that she does not know. On any level, she has no idea. She's completely clueless. And then she says, I don't know if we've been dating for a long time, verbally repeating exactly what he said. This isn't an indicator that she's being authentic during this area, to me at least. What well, I would see this as, at that moment, would be a smoke screen and a persona that she's putting on to try to pull the wool over their eyes. She obviously knows something more than what she's playing because of how overtly out of it she is trying to behave. 
it's very strange. All of you know this. All of you know that Stephanie Lazarus is strange. All the way around, she's very strange. I met Saul in 92, maybe, uh, April of 92. Okay, so this is important. You can see her eyes squinting. She's looking off into the distance. Now, I know for a fact, scientifically speaking, there have been no empirical evidences for directional eye cues, where a person's looking is fake or true, auditory, visual, so on and so forth. It can happen from person to person, but for the universality of nonverbal communication, it does not exist. But there is evidence to show, brought up by researchers at the University of Rochester, that during genuine recollection, a person will look off to the side, be it whatever side, up, down, side, side, whatever, but they will have a slight squint as they're trying <coughs> to recollect. This is due to psychological processing and running through one's own memories. This has been decently proven. It can still have some leeway for error, but it has oh. been largely shown that that is the case. So during this segment, she's authentically recollecting. We want to make note of this because later on she has some points of recollection where that doesn't exist, and that gives us a red flag more or less because then it means that she's not recollecting, she's pretending to recollect. Let's continue. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, I remember in 1996, I think I met something in 92. Prior to that, I couldn't tell you how long I talked, you know, talked to John prior to that. But since um, you since you met your husband, Scott, you haven't talked to him? I mean, he may have called me uh, once or twice uh -huh. before we got married. Right. Um, Consistently having elevated eyebrows. Now, that has a various number of nonverbal possibilities. In this area, it almost makes sense that it would be in the fear, shock, or surprise area of emotion. To have that level of elevated eyebrows is definitely a noticeable tell non-verbally. And she does this consistently throughout the entirety of the interview, which plays in line with her persona that she's trying to put off as just taken aback by any single question. If you listen to what she's saying, she sounds as if she has no idea what she has done in her life. Just not the slightest clue. It's not the case, but that's what she's trying to present. And her conscious movement of her eyebrows there also makes sense with that. Let's continue. You know, geez, I, I, I moved to see me in 1994 because I lost my house in the earthquake. Oh, okay. um, uh, Quite honestly, I probably keep in contact with a few people from the dorms, we, we all we all lived on the 10th floor, um, and... Uh, Interesting choice of words there. Quite honestly, I keep in touch with a few people, blah, blah, blah. And the question is, if she thought that she had to include the term quite honestly in there, why is that? Are there other areas where she's maybe not being quite so honest? The answer is yes, there are other areas where she's not being quite so honest. And that is a verbal slip up of her revealing in a way that she is honest in areas and dishonest in others. It's an interesting facet. You could also pay attention to that. People say things intentionally many times. Sometimes there's slip ups and sometimes there's telling slip ups. Like, well, quite honestly, I probably was in contact with somebody and quite honestly, it could be that I was in contact.